Let's take our Bibles tonight and turn over to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 6, if you would. Deuteronomy chapter 6. We're going to look at one verse for text tonight, and we'll pray, and then we'll get started. But Deuteronomy 6, 12, and if you find your place, let's stand, and we'll read this verse, and we'll get on with it. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse number 12, the Bible says, Then beware, lest thou forget the Lord which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt, from the house of bondage. Father, again tonight, we're thankful for a church that has a midweek service. Amen. And we do pray tonight, Lord, that you'd speak to our hearts, speak through your word and through the spirit of God. And Lord, if there be one here tonight that is not saved, I pray you'd save that individual or individuals or for the one, Lord, who is still struggling with their Christian walk tonight. You might draw them close to you. Their eyes might be open to the truth. And we're going to give you all the praise and all the glory for we do ask it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated. Well, I want to speak tonight on this subject. Don't be reckless. I'll tell you what. How many of you wives in here have reckless husbands when they drive? What are you doing, woman? I'm glad they didn't hear that. Oh, boy. Is it on now? Okay. I can't believe she said that. 55 years we've been married, and never once has she ever been in a wreck with me. Now, she'd been in wrecks on her own, though. Amen. <laughs> but anyway, but I want to speak on that subject tonight. Don't be reckless. Let me give you the definition of reckless. It means the lack of regard for the danger or consequence of one's actions. Amen? Uh, I'll tell you what. We need to be careful that we're not a reckless individual, especially as Christians. And I thought about this as I was preparing. I thought... We're living in a day and age, you know this without a doubt, that we're living in a reckless time, and a recklessness abounds everywhere. Just look around you and see what's going on in our country. And I think about the riots, I think about the mass murders, I think about the lying and cheating that's going on even in our government and every other place you can imagine. And what it seems like, it seems as if there is no danger or consequence in the minds of the individuals that are doing this. Uh, they have no concept of what could happen or what should happen. The, the laws are meant to be obeyed. Amen? Right. I mean, preachers just spoke about that. We may not appreciate what the leadership is doing, but we still need to obey the laws of this land. Right. Amen? Right. But today, that's being thrown out the window and nobody's listening. It seems as if it, they disregard it 100%. And I wonder about you and I tonight, though. How about us in regards to God's law? I mean, this book is not, I say it all the time, this is not a book of options, this is a book of commands. And we have a responsibility to obey the laws of God. But I wonder, are we kind of like the world in that respect, that the laws of God just don't seem to be that important? We know what it says. Unfortunately, the laws of man in our land uh, are not being upheld and enforced. And I think about the laws of this book. For most Christians, we're not upholding the laws in here. Now you say, come on, you're nitpicking. No, I'm not. I, I love our church, and all I want to do is see our church and the people and myself to go up and not backwards. Amen? Uh, and you can take this to the bank. There may not be uh, the laws enforced in our country, but you can mark this down that one day God is going to have a consequence for those that are reckless in their lives and will not obey the law and will not take it seriously. And there's no excuse, really. For you and I that are here tonight, there's no excuse for anyone to be found guilty of disobedience. There's no excuse for it because our God has given us absolutely everything that we need, especially the warnings in His Word. So what I want to do tonight is I want to look at some of those warnings, and most of all these warnings will start with one word, and that word is beware. Now, last week we looked at uh, the word of, and we're going to look at another word tonight, and that is the word beware. I want you to look back at Deuteronomy chapter 6, though, and I want to look down through these verses, starting in verse number 1. The first three verses I want you to see are promised blessings for obedience. 
if we will obey God, God promises to bless us. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse number 1. It says, Now these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you, that you might do them in the land whither you go to possess it, that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep... What's that next word? You ought to circle it because it means exactly that. Uh, keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee, thou and thy son and thy son's sons, all the days of thy life, and that thy days may be what? Prolonged. Prolonged. My goodness, that's a blessing to know that God would allow us to live longer because we obey the commands. And then it goes on, it says, Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be what? Well with thee, and that ye may increase mightily, as the Lord God of thy fathers hath what? Promise thee in the land that floweth with milk and honey. God promises if we will obey that the promises will be given to us in our lives. But then look at chapter 6 again and look at verse 4 through 12. Here are the principles for a God-honoring life. And he gives us all the instructions. He tells us how to do it. We don't have to be found disobeying and guilty of disobedience in our life. It goes on in verse 4. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And by the way, He is the only God. Amen. And thou shalt, now here we go, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God, now notice this, with part of thine heart. No, it says with all thine heart, and with all thy what? Soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command this day shall be in thine heart. What word is that? It's the word of God. That's why it's so important that we do not neglect the word of God on a daily basis. Amen. And then it goes on, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. We all ought to be teaching our children from the Word of God. The first thing they ought to learn when they're little is things about God in the Bible. It says, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and thou shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. When does that mean we're supposed to do it? All the time. And I wonder tonight, ask yourself, even if your children are grown, it's just a husband and wife, or maybe you still have your children, how much of the conversation in your daily activities is about spiritual things? And then we wonder why our children go off, or our grandchildren go off. We wonder why they don't turn out. Now you say, but listen, uh, we have done that. There's no guarantee, amen? But we've got to do what's right and leave it in the Lord's hands. But then it goes on. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. And thou, thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house and on thy gates. I may have told this probably in the past, but my son, his wife is from New Zealand where they live now, and she's a Polynesian, she's a Maori. And when she came to the state, she came on a basketball scholarship. She was uh, held five NCAA Division II basketball records, and she's quite an athlete. But anyway, when she came, she was lost. My son would invite folks to church when I was pastoring in Casper, and Haley just happened to be one of them. Well, she came, and she kept coming, and finally Haley got saved. And of course, you know what happened. They fell in love, and they got married. And they've been married for 28 years. But I remember when the, she first got saved, she couldn't have been saved over maybe a couple, two or three years. And they went off to Bible college in Tennessee at, at Crown College, and we went to visit them, and we walked in their apartment, and it was the craziest thing. On every door, when you shut the front door, there was an 8 and a half by 11 piece of paper on it. If you went to the bathroom, there was an 8 and a half 11 piece of paper on the door on the outside. When you shut the door, there was one on the inside. If you opened a closet, there was one on the closet, outside and inside. You say, what was all the paper? She was doing exactly what that said. That was scripture verses that she had posted on every door, inside and outside, that the word of God was ever before your face. And then verse 10 it says, And it shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which he swore unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities which thou buildest not, and houses full of all good things which thou fillest not, and wells dig which thou diggest not, vineyards and olive trees which thou plantest not, when thou shalt have eaten and be full. But then look at verse number 12. We saw the, 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 the fact that the blessings are there for us. He shows us how to receive the blessings. But God doesn't leave out this last part. He gives a warning. And what does he say? Then beware. After God has done exactly what he said, he's given us the, the promises, fulfilled the promises in our life. Then beware, lest thou what? 
Forget the Lord which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Now, I don't know about you. If you go back and remember when you first got saved, what was it like? I mean, it was exciting. You'd charge hell with a squirt gun believing you could put it out. Amen? Amen. But I wonder, is it the same today? How many times is it that we see the promises of God and we follow the promises of God? God fulfills those promises. Then the next thing you know, when prosperity comes, we back up and we begin to forget where it came from. I want to give you the definition also of beware because this is a little word we're going to see. Beware in the Hebrew means to guard, protect, or take heed. In the Greek, it means to regard with caution. Warning signs. Boy, I'm going to tell you what. They're everywhere. Uh, How many of you have ever driven down the road and you see these great big high lines? they got electric lines. And these lines come over and they drop down into this little chain link enclosure. And there's all these weird boxes in there and these gray things that look like insulators, you know. And and they have it fenced and they've got the, the little thing that sticks out where you can't crawl over. And most of the time on the outside of that, in more than one place, it will say danger or beware. High what? Well, I wonder how many just go right over there and say, well, I wonder what that's like and crawl over that fence and get in there and play. Now, everybody says, oh, that's crazy. You're being ridiculous. Oh, really? How many have you ever been out knocking doors? You come up to a yard, and they've got a fence around the yard, and it says, mean dog. How many of you just rushed right into that yard? When we were in Bible college, when we went, we had an Australian shepherd. His name was Deacon. Deacon was a loving dog. He was a family pet. He was gentle as any thing you'd ever see as long as we were around, but if we weren't around, he was meaner than a junkyard dog. We were living in this house, and I can remember the guys came to pick me up for work the first night, and one of them came out, he went over and they had a chain link fence. Deacon was laying around the other side of the house in the sun. Tommy came around, he kind of went to open that gate, and he jingled that handle a little bit, and Deacon heard that, he came around that corner, And he made a beeline for Tommy, and Tommy slammed the gate in his face, and his teeth went into that chain link, and he's chewing on that, and the blood's running out of his mouth. Well, the next day, Robert Sutton, he wasn't with him the first day. The next day, Robert Sutton was in the car, and they said, Robert, go get Brother Listlin. And Robert very innocently got up, walked over to the gate, and they're all sitting there watching that gate. And man, Deacon came around that corner and hit that fence, and Robert's eyes got about that big. Nobody wanted to come in that yard. Why? Because there was a warning, a mad, 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 mean dog. How many of you ever seen this one? You go up to a house and knock on doors. I can still remember in Oklahoma City when we ran the bus routes, this was a Smith & Wesson 44 mag cut out of a piece of wood. And it said, don't be worried about the dog. Be concerned about the owner. Now, if you saw that, the house is protected by Smith & Wesson. Are you going to go up there and just grab that door and walk in? Now, you say, what does all this mean? We will regard many warning signs. We won't tamper with the high power. We won't tamper in the yard where there's a bad dog. We're not going to go and try to uh, intrude on somebody that has protected by Smith & Wesson. But why is it that we don't usually listen to the warning signs in the Bible? Amen. Come on. This preacher loves the church. I'm not here to make anybody feel bad, but you know what it is to make us stop and think of what we're doing in our lives. Deuteronomy gives a warning of potential danger from our worst enemy. Look back at chapter 6 and look at verse number 12. Read over there just a few words. It says, then beware lest, what's that next word? Thou. You know, everybody says, well, the devil's my enemy. The devil made me do it. No, the worst enemy that we've got is not the devil. It's ourself. And we're the ones that allow it to happen. So we need to make sure that we do not forget. Now, I want to look at several things tonight. Look over at Deuteronomy chapter 8, if you would. And let's look at verse number 1 down to verse 11. The first one I want to see is this. Beware that we do the word of God in our lives. Boy, you say, I can quote the Bible, and I know where it's at in the Bible. Well, that's great, that's wonderful, but what are you doing with it in your life? Look over here at chapter number 8, and look at verse number 1. It says, there's that word again, all the commandments which I command you this day shall you observe to what? Do, that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers, 
And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldst keep his commandments or no. And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger, and he fed thee with manna which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. And by the way, you and I have got to eat food, but if we're not into the word of God and we're malnutrition in the word of God, we're going to struggle, just like we would if we quit eating. And then it goes on in verse number four. Thy raiment waxed not old upon thee, neither did thy foot swell these forty years. Thou shalt also consider in thine heart that as man chasteneth his son, so the Lord God chasteneth thee. Don't kid yourself. When we are disobeying God, the hand of God will come down in a chastening manner. And then it says, Therefore shalt thou keep the commandments of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways and to fear him, for the Lord thy God belongeth uh, into thy good, bringeth into thy good hand a land of brooks and of water, of fountains and depths that spring out of the valley and hills, a land of wheat and barley and vines and fig tree and pomegranates, a land of oil, olive and honey. Again, all of these blessings that he bestowed upon Israel. A land wherein thou shalt eat bread without scarceness. Thou shalt not lack anything in it. The land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills thou mayest dig brass. When thou hast eaten and are full, then thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good land which he hath given thee. But look at verse number 11. There's the warning. Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God in not keeping what? His commandments and his judgments and his statutes which I command thee this day. You know, we need to do more than just read the word of God. Uh, pastor is going, he's over and over and about that. You can sit down and you say, well, I want to read my Bible through. And you go through five pages every day. You go through it in a year. But you don't remember one thing that you read. There's more to the word of God than just going through it and saying you've done it. We need to study it. I've said this, I've enjoyed it more the last few months. I, I've gone through my Bible more than once, and, and I stopped, and I'm taking a book at a time, and maybe a chapter or two at the very most, but I'm going down to those verses and looking at words and finding out exactly what it means, and it's been so enriching. And you know what it makes you want to do? It wants to make you just draw closer to the Lord. It wants you, makes you to want to walk more with Him, more than ever before. But we need to study it. We need to meditate on it. Take something. I, these little books we have over here in the, the library, and I, I got those, I don't know, a couple years ago, and said, you need to take down a, a journal. And I started doing that. I do it in the book of Proverbs. And now, in the books that I'm going to, I take a verse somewhere that God points out, and I write something out about that, and then I think about it. Amen. We all need to do that. Amen. And we need to love it. You know, it's, it's like the tutors there. When Brother Richard was dating Miss... Carol, you know, they wrote those love letters and Carol would write to him and he would write to her and he would say, sweetie, you know, your eyes are like two shimmering pools of water. Your lips are like rosy cherries. I can't wait to hold you again in my arms. Poopsie whoopsie. You know what? Amen. Amen. And you know what? Uh, she, he would write that to her. She'd look at it. She'd tear it up and throw it away. No, I promise you, she probably, if she's got letters, still got them. And what they would do, they would take that letter and they would open it up and they would read it again and again until the envelope was tattered and torn and the letter was worn. Why is it not like that with our Bibles? I mean, if we love somebody, when we get a letter from a loved one, do you know what that is? That impacts our life. This is a love letter from God Almighty to His children. Amen. And not only love it, but we need to believe it. Believe every word that's written in it. The lost world doesn't believe it, but we surely should. We should proclaim it. Amen. Pastor talked about in the, in the Sunday school meeting that we need to give the word of God out. It's not our responsibility, as he said, to bring the increase. Our responsibility is to give it. We need to proclaim it. We need to trust it. Hey, listen, we say we're trusting it for eternity. We ought to trust it on a daily basis. We ought to live it in our lives. And we ought to guard it. And you say, how do we guard it? I said this last week. We guard the word of God by obeying it. Because when we disobey, the world knows exactly who we are. They know what we should be doing. And if we're not doing that, we're putting a black mark against the Lord Jesus Christ and the word of God. You think about Israel. Israel knew God's word, but they were not doing it. Tonight, we need to beware 
of knowing but not doing the Word of God. Look over at Luke chapter 12 now. If you would, Luke chapter 12, and let's look at the first three verses there. I want you to see the second warning. Then we need to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Amen. And this is a serious one. Look at, look at verse number 1 of chapter 12 of Luke down through verse number 3. In verse 1 it says, In the meantime, when there were gathered together an innumerable multitude of people, insomuch that they trod one upon another, he began to say unto his disciples, first of all, Beware of what? Of the leavens of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, and neither hid that shall not be known. Therefore, whatsoever ye have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light, and that which ye have spoken in the ear in the closet shall be proclaimed upon the housetop. I think about this. We better be careful that we are not hypocrites. And you say, what do you mean by that? A hypocrite is somebody that simulates or is deceitful. In other words, you say one thing, but you're totally something else. If you say you're a Christian tonight and you say that you love God, you know what? It needs to be seen in our lives. It needs to be seen by godliness. You know, pastor talked about this. If we have holiness inside, what comes out? The godliness. If we're walking with the Lord and the Holy Spirit is in control of our life, if we live like that, you mark it down. The purity of our life and the love that's in our heart will be displayed in our godly lifestyle. Amen. And God has given us a warning. He said, beware. Uh, the Pharisees were those that walked around with their thumbs in their lapels and they had all the talk. They had no walk though. And you remember it said the Pharisees, they derided Jesus. You know what they did? They didn't like what Jesus stood for because he was real and they were phonies. Right. And here's the thing. What we do, whether it be in public or it be behind closed doors, whatever we do, if it's not true, one day it'll be revealed. And it doesn't have to be. Listen, it doesn't, because God has given us the warning right there that don't be like the Pharisees. If you say you're a Christian, you say you're saved, then conduct yourself in a manner that proves that. Amen. Look over, if you would, also at Galatians 5, and I want you to see this is the fruit of the Spirit. But I believe also this, that if we are true Christians and we are living a, an honest life, these things are going to be seen in our lives. Look there at Galatians 5 and look at verse 19. This is what we were before. It says, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, reveling, and such like of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God, but the fruit of the Spirit. And remember, you say, well, I've got some of this. You know, that's one fruit. And it has many characteristics. And we need to bear that fruit with all the characteristics in our life. Notice what it says. The fruit of the Spirit is love. It's not the love of the world. It's not the phileo love. That's agape love. And joy. Sometimes, I know pastor sees this, you stand up here and you preach and you look out and people have, you've got the pooch mouth, looks like you sucked on a green persimmon. And you know what? You can be going through the greatest of trials and still have the joy of the Lord. You can. You say, but that just seems impossible. It doesn't, because God is our joy. It's not the surroundings we're in. But then it goes on. It says peace. We ought to be peacemakers instead of troublemakers. Amen. A lot of button pushers in the world today, they know exactly the button to, pu button to push to cause trouble. We oughtn't be those button pushers, amen? amen. Boy, it's not getting many amens tonight, but that's all right. Uh, also, long-suffering. How long's your fuse? Well, my fuse, I got a long fuse. It's about that big. No, our fuse needs to be like this. Do you know whose fuse was long? The Lord Jesus' fuse was real long. I think of what he put up with me in my life before I got saved. I'm amazed that he didn't kill me first. And then it goes on. It says gentleness. Not like a bull in a china closet. Goodness and faith. Meekness. And then there's temperance. Boy, look at that. That means self-control. God has given us the ability with the Holy Spirit living inside that we can have self-control. Because he will control us. He won't let us go where we shouldn't go. He will not let us think what we shouldn't think. He will not let us say what is wrong. There's no reason for anybody to have to face the judgment of God because we have the warnings and the bewares. And then if you look, it goes on, it says, 
And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. Now look at verse 25. If we live in the Spirit, let us what? Also walk in the Spirit. Amen. We need to be aware of what we say and that we do in our lives. But then look over at Romans, if you would. Romans chapter number 10 and verse number 12. Here's another warning sign. It says, beware of self-righteousness. Now, self-righteousness can really be a problem. You know what that means? That's when we get the big head and we think we know everything and we got all things in control. I like what Paul said. He said, I have not what? Basically arrived. He said, he said I've not arrived yet. And you and I need to realize that as long as we're alive on this earth, we still got more growth, we got more learning to do, we got more maturing to do. But look at 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 12. It says, Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. That little phrase, take heed, that's the exact thing as beware. Beware lest he what? Fall. We'll never arrive spiritually. We never will. And God gives a warning to that. Have you ever seen anybody that they, they walk around and they seem like they're just a step above everybody else? And it's in our churches. It is. I mean, what, anybody know the syndrome I invented? ENS syndrome. Rod, remember it. ENS, elevated nose syndrome. Boy, I didn't get much laughter out of that one. But it's a fact. God gives a warning against that. When we walk around with our nose stuck in the air, we don't think we have any problems. We don't think we'll ever fall. We're just, we're just better than everybody else. That's not true. And we need to be very careful about that. Look at Romans chapter 7. And if Paul confesses this, as great a Christian as Paul was, then we need to realize that we have faults too. Look at Romans chapter 7 and verse 15. It says, for that which I do, I what? Allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that what? Do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing, for to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. Amen. For the good that I would I do not, but the evil which I would not that I do. Now, tonight in here there's nobody that's better than Paul. Amen? Right. That starts on this pulpit and goes all the way through this church. There is nobody better than Paul. And if Paul said that, then we need to realize that self-righteousness, self-exaltation eventually will end up in a fall and disaster. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 13, and again, I love this is where Paul makes the statement. In verse 13, he said, Brethren, I count not myself to have what? Apprehended. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. You know, I think of the, the runners in the Olympics, those that run that 100-meter dash. Boy, those guys are something else. They had one the other day, I saw the finish line, and some guy was running in that 100-meter dash, and he was close, but he didn't think he was going to make it. You know what he did? He launched himself off his feet and slid down the track, but he won. Because he was pressing on, and he wanted to win the race. Amen? And I think about what Paul is saying there. He is not looking back. I'll never forget, Bruce Foster was the vice president of OBC, and he knew my background, where I'd come from. He said, I want to give you some good advice. He said, what happened yesterday is in the past. You can't do anything about it. He said, as you go along in life, he said, when you cross every bridge in life, he said, you burn that bridge behind you and don't ever build it again. Because I think sometimes we'll go back and we'll think about what we've done somewhere else and we exalt ourselves. Listen, that is a dangerous, dangerous situation. We must always press on, never satisfied with where we're at for the Lord. Beware of that self-righteousness because it will destroy. Then look over at Luke chapter 12 and look at verse 15. Here's another. We need to beware of covetousness. And let me give you the definition of covetous. It means a greedy desire to have more or possess more. In Luke chapter 12 and verse 15, 
And he said unto them, Take heed, and what's our next word? Beware, Beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. Now, this was just before the story of the rich fool. And you remember how that guy, boy, he had all this, and he said, I'm going to build new barns, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that. You and I cannot live like the world and have the blessings of God. I don't think there's a thing wrong. If you're here tonight and you have a million dollars in the bank, praise the Lord for that. I mean, if you have a lot of stuff, it doesn't make any difference. What makes a difference is where your priorities are. I've known some rich people. In fact, a, a man that was 41 years old, he retired at 41. He was worth $57 million. You know what he did with most of his money? He used it on the Lord. Uh, when we were there, they, they had a Christian school. They needed a building. This man stepped up and he said, I will build the building. Turnkey. $750,000 he built that. He didn't want anybody to even know about it. Now that's one thing. But what about the person that looks at everything, desires everything, and does everything in their power to get that? They'll work, they save their money, and they're going for that one thing, and that's that thing they desire most. You know what the world does? The world and the covetous nature of the world will steal the heart, our heart from God. It will. Look at Matthew chapter 6 and verse 19. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 19 through 21. It says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your what? Heart be also. I'll tell you what, our heart ought to be focused on the things of God. You say, but I've got to make a living. I've got to pay my bills. There's no question about that. But that is something that we have to do. We may not enjoy it, but we ought to enjoy the things of God, and we ought to put our whole heart into doing it. I wonder, why not covet spiritual things instead of worldly things? I think of a young man. He came to college. i never forget it. Remember Dave and his wife? They came from a, a rural community. They were so poor. They had two or three little children. The kids hardly had any clothes when they came. I mean, they were poor. They really were. And he was a good preacher. He was a good preacher. He was a good soul, ran a bus route, did all of that stuff. But you know what? He got started. And unfortunately, we helped him get started. And it started in the paper business. So my wife and I, I was assistant manager. And we threw 650 daily, 750 Sundays. But back when we first started and we got him involved in it, they had a, a, an evening paper plus a morning paper. And we got him started, and he started out with a couple hundred papers, and he kept building it up. He got up to over 1,100 papers a day. And you know what, he ha what happened? He made more money than he'd ever made in his life. I can remember the first thing he did, he dropped out of school. Next thing, he was sporadic in the services, and he wasn't coming to church. And I remember we went to, to vote somewhere at a polling place, and I know my wife had gone in. I'd already voted. She went in. And I'm sitting in the car, and I see him get out and walk in, and I hollered at him, and I said, hey, wh what are you up to? And he was not pleasant. He said, don't go start preaching to me. And you know what it was? It was the covetousness of what he never had that he wanted. It became the desire of his heart. And we've got to be very careful. We need to be aware of the world's riches uh, and have spiritual poverty. That's what happens. We, we desire and covet the world. We go for the world, and we put everything into the world, and the next thing you know, we're spiritually destitute. Right. But then look at Colossians chapter 2, and look, if you would, at verse number 6. The next is, beware of the philosophy of man. And buddy, I'll tell you what, this is being pushed in every area and way you can imagine today in society. Right. All these crazy things they're trying to teach in our schools to the young people that will turn them against the right. things of God will turn them against our nation. It's wrong, and that's the philosophy of man. It's not the philosophy of God. But look at chapter 2, if you would, and look at verse number 6. It says, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so what? Walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware. There it is. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Yep. Now notice verse 9 and 10. 
And this ought to be the, the frosting on the cake for you and I. For in him dwelleth what? All the fullness of the Godhead bodily in verse number 10. And ye are what? Complete in him which is the head of all principality and power. Wow. Liberal philosophies are creeping in. I mean, look at our government today. Look at our schools. I remember, and most of you, Gary's older than dirt. He knows this for sure. But I remember when I went to school. Do you know where I, I basically learned to pray? It was in a public school. Do you know where I learned the national anthem? Do you know where we sang all the old Bible hymns? It was in a public school at North Prairie School in Illinois. That's the way it was. And there wasn't anybody complaining about it. At, at Christmas time, guess what the school did for the Christmas program? They did the Christmas story. I mean, all the, the outfits and everything, and, and it was a big deal. But today, man, they won't even let you bring that. You can't bring a Bible to school. Liberal philosophies are creeping in the lives even of Christians. It's creeping in our homes through the Internet, through television. And even fundamental churches today are changing what they believe, and they're going with the philosophy of the world. You don't want to preach like our pastor preaches. You know why? Because you're going to offend somebody, and they won't come back. Well, tell the Lord Jesus that. Amen. Amen. I wonder if Christ were here today, and I'm talking about the philosophy of man in this world. If Christ were here today, would we say and talk the way we talk? Would we listen to the same music or watch the same things on television if he was present? I wonder about our dress. Would our clothing be pleasing to him because uh, it's still the old way the Bible describes it? Or is it taking on the new worldly trends and anything goes? Or I wonder, is our conduct at all times, not just when you're here at church, but is our conduct when we're outside of this building and we're away from other Christians, is our conduct pleasing unto God? We need to be aware of whose side we're really on and not follow the philosophy of man. But then the last thing, and I'll quit. I want you to look at Revelation chapter 2 and look at verse 1 through 4. We need to be aware also that we don't leave our first love. I'm going to tell you what. I love my wife, but I love the Lord a lot more than I love my wife. And you say, well, that sounds terrible. No, my wife knows that. And if you ask her who she loves the most, she'll tell you the exact same thing. It's not me. It's the Lord Jesus. Amen. Look at Revelation 2 and verse number 1. It says, Under the angel of the church of Ephesus is right these things, saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. You know what? We can be going through all the motions. We can be going through the traditions outwardly but we can be spiritually cold and dead inside. It says, And hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou what? Hast left thy first love. Do you realize our Christian life hinges totally, 100%, not on our church attendance, not on our tithing, not on our witnessing, it hinges 100% on relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. And I wonder, is it what it should be? Is, is, your, is your heart sold out to him to where he is everything to you? I could lose my house and I would still have the world. I can lose my health. My wife says, since my birthday Sunday, she said, all you're thinking about is dying. <laughs> if I die, guess what? I gain. Amen. But I don't tell her that. <laughs> but we need to be aware that we do not forget our first love. And you think about everything we've read tonight, the first part in Deuteronomy, of all that God said he would do and what he has done. And he gives us a warning that we would never have to fall short of what he wants. We never have to be found guilty of disobedience if we would just beware and watch the warning signs and apply the things in our life that he has laid out for us. We would never have to be concerned about standing before him with our heads hanging down because we know we've not lived the way we should. Beware. Don't be reckless because we have a Lord that's watching absolutely everything. Let's bow our heads, please. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. Let me ask you tonight, 
I wonder if there might be one tonight in this place that would say, if I was to die right now, I am not 100% sure I'd go to heaven. I do not want to die and go to a lake of fire. Anybody like that tonight that would be honest, mostly with yourself? Anybody? I wonder how many tonight would say this. My prayer is that I would watch the warning signs in the Bible more now than ever before that I might not have to stand guilty before my God unnecessarily. How many tonight you'd say, my prayer is that I would watch the warning signs more now than ever before and that I would walk closer with my Lord. How many of that would be your prayer? Let me see your hand tonight. Just stick it up. Father, I thank you this evening.